Hi folks, so this topic is rule-based sandboxing and manager access controls, which is essentially around how we can define rules for what the different programs that are running on our computer are allowed to do. So in the last topic we looked at how we could take an isolation-based approach, like the way that Docker containers works, for example, uh, or just putting things in a virtual machine. Um, it, it's good if we just want things to be separate, but if instead what we want to do is have things interacting on our system, but be able to limit what each thing on our system is allowed to do based on what it needs to be able to do um, in its interactions with the other resources and programs on the computer, then this is what this is for. And the great benefit of taking this approach um, and or an isolation approach is that when something goes wrong, the damage that can result in it is limited. So if in the worst case scenario, an attacker takes full control over a piece of software that's running on our computer, well, if that software has been restricted to only do, do specific things, then, then rather than the normal ambient authority that would be allowed on a standard um, system, for example, then the amount of damage it can do will be limited by what the rules say that program's allowed to do. So the more restrictive, uh, the better, because the principle of least privilege, this idea that the, the more that we can just give it what it needs to do its job, that way when something goes wrong, it can still just do those kinds of things that it needed to be able to do. It might still be able to re, um, misuse, misbehave or use those privileges incorrectly, but we're still getting closer to um, limiting the damage that can happen. So there's a, the... One kind of system is to have a um, rule-based sandboxes. So that's where we have, basically, we launch a program into a special environment where we have some extra rules that apply. And the traditional um, system that fits the bill that we're talking about is system call into position, which is basically where you have a program um, which can launch another program into a controlled in a controlled way to say, okay, you can run, but every time you make a system call, it goes through me. And then I'll filter out what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do based on the system calls you're making. Uh, so it's kind of like acting like a debugger kind of thing, but it's kind of interrupting um, each system call that happens. And so there's some examples listed on the slide. So there's SysTrace, Genus, eTrace, Tron, they were all kind of popular back in the day. They're not, they don't see use anymore, really, for a few reasons. Um, one is there are, better, there are better solutions now, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but the main disadvantage is that system calls were never really designed for this purpose. It was kind of clunky and weird the way that to try and write rules that are about system calls. Mostly like opening a file, I guess you can understand, and it's not too bad. But when you start accessing the network, for example, and there's like lots of different system calls involved in connecting um, or listening on specific ports and things. Um, it can, it's just was never really designed for it. And then you end up having to maintain the state of the kernel um, to try and track what's actually happening outside of the kernel as well as the state that's in the kernel. So, um, you know, it's doable, it's possible, um, but you know, I really not use that much. So the better approach is to build it into the kernel, build it into it as a proper security control um, that gets enforced on a system level. And we just have sets of rules that apply to specific programs or applications. And when a program starts that fits one of those rules, or that, then we just apply those rules to what that program's allowed to do. So usually it's a mandatory control. So if a um, there's, it's not something that gets configured within a user's home directory, for example. It's configured on a system level by someone who has like a sys sysadmin type role. And the users on the system don't really get to choose that the, the admin person specifies policy and then it applies to everything that's running on the computer, usually. So then when one program starts another program, um, it is something special that needs to considering. So because if we wanted to try and set a rule for the RN program, for example, that deletes files, you might say, 
okay, you can delete files. Well, okay, but now if everyone can run RM, they can delete all the files. Or it might be, if, if RM is run by a, the um, Firefox, for example, it can just delete files that Firefox could delete. Or it just stays in Firefox's profile of the rules that apply to Firefox. So that's part of the rules, is what the program's allowed to do and what happens when they run another program. So, <clears throat> first of all, there are coarse-grained write-based systems. So something like Android, which we'll talk about, um, a little, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. There's Bitfrost, um, and so you know that basically it's like where you say, okay, you can access the camera and GPS or whatever. So you've got these coarsely grained writes, and you say yes or no, you're allowed to do it. Linux capabilities is similar. So what Linux capabilities is, is it's a bunch of flags, like a bunch of like yes or no's, like uh, around root, roots privileges. So roots, special permission, permissions, things that roots are allowed to do, like do raw network access um, and um, to um, like not have, not be confined by any of the um, file permissions and things like that. Each of those permissions can be is broken down into separate capabilities, um, and then a program can actually drop capabilities to say that oh I am running as root, but I don't want these other capabilities, uh, which means that you can limit the ability of what root can do. So when root tries to do something, if capabilities are in effect, then um, the root will still be confined to not have all the powers that root gets to have. Um, so, you know, the disadvantage of using coarse grained rules is you can't actually represent all of the things you'd want to restrict that way. So you can't really say, well, okay, you're allowed to access this file, but this other program's not allowed to access this file, but you can access that file. And things like that, it's better for like, okay, you can use the camera or you can't use the camera. You can access GPS, you can't. So it makes sense for some kind of resources, but not not all of them. And it's easy to understand because there's just like a specific set of like sw toggle switches of like, yes, you can do these things, or no, you can't. Um, so like normally on a Linux system, you've got these privileged users that are runners, UID0 and everyone else that runs everything else. Root gets to everything. Capability is divided up. Um, and so, for example, another example is uh, cap ch root, so that they can change the um, you know ch root, which we covered uh, last in the last topic, uh, to you know control containers and things. So you can use capabilities to give a specific program the ability to do that without being able to do like all everything else that root can do. So you can you can grant or remove capabilities from indiv individual processes. And programs can be programmed to drop cap capabilities. They can delete or temporarily disable capabilities. And program files, so the actual executable file, you can um, attach capabilities to it so that when that program starts, they start with those capabilities. And you can, you can do cool things like remove capabilities from the entire system. So you can have bounding capability bounding sets. And that means you can do something like remove the ability for kernel modules to get loaded after the computer starts. So that can prevent rootkits and things from taking hold. Um, but once the computer started, I'm not going to let any new kernel modules load, um, which could stop some shenanigans if, if an attacker got root access, for example. So you can kind of limit even root from loading modules into the kernel. So then that provides a better separation between kernel Stuff that happens in kernel, kernel, kind of privilege level, things that root can do, and like programs that are running as every other user. Normally, the kernel and root thing is quite closely related because root can just change the kernel. Um, but um, you know, you can use capabilities to limit that ability to load modules into the kernel. Uh, there's domain and type enforcement (DTE), uh, which is where you have types that you assign to processes and you assign domains to resources and then the rules specify which domains authorized to access which type. SE Linux is a um, 
it's it's a security enhanced Linux, um, and it was developed by the NSA, uh, and it adds mandatory access controls to Linux itself. And so within the Linux kernel, it adds a bunch of extra features, and basically combines a bunch of complicated access control models. It's got um, DTE, so domain and type enforcement, which is like an application oriented part of it. There's role based access control, which is like user, user oriented, and there's like multi level security. And it combines all that stuff in like this complicated security model. Um, and the result is extremely complex policies. If you try and read through SE Linux's policies, it's quite complicated. But basically, every file on the system has a security label attached to it that defines the type. And the transition rules state which domain a process is, is in and what um, types the domain can access. And so you have these, these rules. It's label based. So um, what matters is the metadata attached to each file and each binary executable. So when the program starts, it's got um, the, um, the like domain that's attached to it. And every file has like its type. That's attached through um, ex like security properties if, of the metadata of the file. So quite complicated. Um, there's um, there's kind of the old saying when SE Linux kind of first came out was like the most common question about SE Linux is how to turn it off. Um, and the you know I've had a few interactions with the the um, Developers who created SE Linux and their their like opinion or their original intention is that they don't want users to touch it. Basically, like if SE Linux is like set up by the experts and it's running on your system, you shouldn't need to care. It's just going to lock down some of those processes that are running on your computer. It's not meant to be something that you configure on a whim um, as an end user. So that obviously means that it's um, it might not be your go-to tool unless you spend quite a bit of time kind of building up your your um, knowledge of how SE Linux works. But it is amazing. It's the most complete um, mandatory access control system that is available on a commercial operating system. So it's really cool. Um, and, you know, it's created by the NSA for, you know, military purposes and things like they, um, and, you know, intelligence purposes and things. So it's good. Um, if you can afford to spend the time to try and figure out how it works. Another approach that's much easier to manage is a, a um, rule-based approach that um, it basically lists a bunch of resources that each program is allowed to access. And so something like AppArmor or Tomoyo, um, you have a file that is like in AppArmor there's a profile file and it just lists all the files that a program is allowed to access by its path name. Um, so rather than working on labels is the way that SE Linux works. So the advantages of that is it's much easier to wrap your head around. You can learn how AppArmor works in about, I don't know, 15 minutes. <clears throat> you know, like you, it might take you a little bit more to become comfortable with it and everything, but the concepts are not that complicated. So simpler to get into. Um, the SE Linux folks would argue that it's not right that that the um, that it uses paths instead of um, labels because it you know do you, do you want the security properties to change when you move a file? Actually, the answer is often yes. If you move a file into Apache into the Apache www directory, you expect Apache to start reading that file. But if you're using SE Linux, the, if it's been labeled one way and you move the location it's still not going to be able to have access until you relabel the files. So, you know, there's pros and cons um, of the two approaches. It's definitely not as complete of a system as SE Linux is, but it is also a lot more accessible and, um, you know, manageable. Um, on, like, newer versions of Windows since Vista, there's this idea of integrity levels. And so you have um, SIDs, the security identifiers that are used to make security decisions. Um, but there's a new access control entry type, ACE type, um, that represents integrity levels. And it restricts programs that are less trustworthy. 
Um, and so, for example, you can have um, the web browser running at a reduced integrity level, which means that it can't um, like access the files that are running at a higher integrity level. So it's kind of, you can think of it as a, um, they're like restriction-based rules, but it is also sort of broadly categorizing them into like a few different groups of privilege level. But it can limit the damage that can happen if Internet Explorer or Edge or whatever has a security vulnerability. So it works without user involvement. There's actually no tools to configure it within, within um, Windows. Uh, and yeah, so for example, um, like the web browser runs at a lower integrity. So it can't write to high integrity files without some user interaction. Like, are you sure you want to do this? And other integrity-based schemes includes the Seminal Fiber Access Control model, which I mentioned in the Access Control um, topic. So integrity-based schemes are it's essentially mandatory access controls, and it, it may improve security, but um, it doesn't confine an application to only what it requires. It just kind of like separates it out from other things. Since Windows 8, um, there's also this idea of an app container, it only applies to apps that you get from the App Store or the, the Microsoft Marketplace or whatever it's called. Um, and it works for the Metro or um, modern um, apps or you know whatever they're calling it at the moment. Um, but if you develop it, you, one of their apps using that framework, then um, it kind of basically works um, the same, similar to the way Android security works, actually. So it gets access to its app data directory. It doesn't get access to everything. It's more restricted than that. Any other access at once, so for example, documents, music, or videos, or whatever, requires specific permission or some user interaction. So when it tries to access it, it'll, you know, they have to access it through some interaction to basically give the permission to the program. An app container is a new integrity level, and each application has its own SID. Um, similar to the way, actually, on Android runs every application as a separate UID, which is using the Unix, uh, Linux kernel, uh, but on Android, every program actually runs as a separate user account. Um, so, and this is similar to the way Android works as well. Um, in win with, the, with the Windows like app container, Windows since Windows 8, um, applications declare what cap capabilities they want ahead of time. So they say, you know, they have a manifest file that describes what they want to be able to do, and then, um, you know, when you install it, you're kind of giving it permission to do those things. And the, you know, there's some links there if you want to read some more about it. Android security, I'll just say a few things about. Which I've, so I've just mentioned, Android also is based on having a manifest file that has a set of permissions that the author wants the program to have, which means that um, it limits the damage due to like a security vulnerability because it only has to do what the program wanted to be able to do. But it still kind of requires you to trust the program with all these permissions. The newer versions of Android now include the ability to take away permissions and run it without giving it access to all the things that it asks for. Um, and the way that it does it is basically it runs every application with a separate UID and it uses the Linux kernel. And I guess like ironically, eventually they decided they wanted Android to work with multiple users. And then because they'd already overloaded the thing that UID was used for, they then had to use like containers and stuff to try and work around how you would have multiple users on a system. So. It's kind of like a backwards um, Linux system, but it's uh, still quite interesting. So yeah, Android's based on Linux kernel um, and a bunch of libraries and things that are mostly written in C, but then the, um, the actual Android runtime environment um, is, um, you know, actually the programs themselves are written in Java and run in like a Java virtual machine type thing. And then there are sandbox rules that apply based on these global permissions, like coarsely grained permissions that applications ask for, either in advance or when they need them. And um, they can also define permissions, and, and applications by the same author can share access to the same files. 
So, you know, it's quite interesting. Android security is um, it's good. It's a move in the right direction. So you can start to see that things are starting to move towards applications being further restricted. Whereas, you know, traditionally every program that run is, is untrusted. Um, and so it means that it's actually safer to install an app from the Android um, Play Store or, or whatever than it is to install a, a normal program, desktop program on Windows or Linux. Um, but you were starting to see those features come in place on, on Linux as well. And I haven't mentioned other things. There are other systems as well. So on Linux, there's also a, the Snap um, packages, which can include confinement, but you can um, have entire software packages that um, can run but um, with like less access to your system. <clears throat> so in conclusion, you now know a variety of ways you can use to protect yourself from the applications that you run. Uh, this is an active area of research. Uh, it's the I did my um, PhD topic in this in this area, but there's there's a lot of room for innovation and things we're not quite there yet. There's still a lot of ambient authority. There's still a lot of programs that get run with more permissions than they need. But I hope you found that interesting and useful, um, and it'll help you to design systems that are secure and think about how you can really lock down and secure systems that you're running to make sure that you can limit the amount of damage that happens.